Good afternoon. My name is Diane Randall. I am the General Secretary of the Friends Committee on National Legislation. And I want to welcome all of our guests today who have joined us to talk about child poverty uh, with uh, Bread for the World and Senator Sherrod Brown of Ohio. Um, we are very uh, happy to have you join us because we know that we are meeting with scores of advocates around the country who have worked to try to address COVID relief uh, and to address the consequences of this pandemic in terms of the economic fallout that so many people have experienced. With me is my co-host, Reverend Eugene Cho. Thank you so much, uh, Diane. Again, for those that I'm meeting for the very first time, I'm Reverend Eugene Cho, president at Bread for the World. This is a, a great a privilege for us to be able to partner with all of you and especially our friends at FCNL. Uh, before we introduce our special guest, um, uh, Diane and I, uh, we wanna just take a moment, an important moment to acknowledge some of the horrific shootings in our nation in both in Boulder, Colorado and in Atlanta. We wanna mourn and lift up families that are right now mourning the loss of their loved ones. Additionally, we wanna name and acknowledge the reality and surge of anti-Asian hate and violence seen not just in Atlanta, but around the nation and around the world. This is why we're here, friends, whether it's speaking up condemning hate and violence, or advocating for those who experience hunger and poverty abroad or here, our faith in Christ, we want to do justice together. So with that in mind, uh, for our special guest this afternoon, we are really honored and delighted to have Senator Sherrod Brown with us. He has been uh, the champion behind these credits for years, and he was instrumental in getting them into this bill. Uh, he's a friend to us all, and I am so pleased that he has taken time out of his busy schedule to talk with all of us. So, Senator Brown, we do see you on the screen. I think your mute button is on at this time, but uh, we would like to invite you to share some opening uh, remarks. You're still muted, Senator Brown. Um, well, I'll just do it. All right, sorry. A bit of a technical, thank you, Eugene. It's, it's great to be with you again today. Thank you. And uh, Chad is here and Chad, I've only gotten, Chad can say hi real quick, Chad. Hey everybody, uh, believe it or not, <laughs> here in person. Uh, it's so good to be back at the Capitol and so good to be with you guys today. Thank you for um, everything that you've done for us on the refundables and specifically your efforts most recently on the uh, the letter that we just sent to President Biden. Just thank you so much and good to see everybody actually here in person. Yes, thank you. And thanks. And Chad, Chad, this is only the second time I've seen Chad since, um, well, for a year. And Katie's with us today too. And usually no staff are here. So they didn't trust me with you guys. I guess they don't trust bread for the world and friends. I don't know how they couldn't trust you to you all of you. So anyway, but thank you. And uh, Eugene, thanks for the really common, the really kind words, Reverend Cho and Diane Randall. Thank you. I don't see you on the screen. Are you there somewhere? But um, thanks. And thanks to the activists with bread for the world and friends. And I, um, I, there's, there's, I would put you two in my, in, in Joanne Carter and results kind of as, just some of my favorite groups in Washington. So, and for the whole country, for that matter. How now? I see Diane. How are you? Good to see you. Um, I, I, some of you, and I apologize for retelling this story, but you have to listen since you put me on. Um, my mother, when I, I grew up at St. Luke's Lutheran Church, a small. Um, it, it was not the Missouri Senate conservative, but we were a pretty conservative congregation um, in Mansfield, Ohio. And my mom grew up in a little town in Georgia. She grew up in Mansfield, Georgia. My dad in Mansfield, Ohio. They met in this town in Washington uh, during World War II. My dad was stationed overseas and came back and was at a soldier's dance. And my mom was there and they, they met and soon after married, um, like so many couples that met during or around World War II. She then, the girl from Mansfield, Georgia, a little town um, in the South, married my dad from Mansfield, Ohio, and they settled in 
in Mansfield, Ohio, my mom was this very shy, as she tells it, little girl that came, she was 25, 26, that came from, um, from small town Georgia. And one of the things I always remember my mom during the, during the busing controversy in the 1960s and 70s, my mom said, said, yeah, I remember busing when I was growing up in Georgia. She was born in 1920 and she said, I remember busing. Uh, they used to bus the black kids in an old rickety school bus past our new white school and send them to the inferior falling apart black school. And that's what, and she said, that's what busing was that I remember. It tells you a lot about my mom's progressive values. And, and so long story longer, my mom became an active volunteer with Bread for the World. She used to once a year, she would, um, uh, she would get people at church. They'd, circ they'd, they'd take the collection plate and collect letters um, to members of Congress saying you ought to do your jobs as citizens and as religious people and as Christians and and help people. And my mom always appealed to people in the right way. She never lectured. She never um, did sort of a admonish. She didn't admonish people. She just encouraged people, except for me. She admonished me a lot, but that's a whole other story. So um, th th this is this month walking out of the vote. The vote was three weeks ago. Yeah, three weeks ago tomorrow. And we had voted all night, Saturday morning, we voted about noon or one o'clock in the afternoon. And walking out, I said, a reporter said, what, what do you think? And I said, best day of my, of my career. And I mean, look, look what we did. Look what we, shots in people's arms and money in people's pockets and kids back in school and people back in jobs. And 90, 92% of Ohio children 92% of Ohio children will benefit from the child tax credit. And as you know, when I started working on this, I, actually I used to do EITC stuff when I was in the house many years ago. When I started working in earnest on what we were gonna do next and introduce the American Families Act in 2013. In those days, as you remember, the earned income tax credit was significantly larger than the child tax credit. And both were important, but as, we introduced the bill and didn't get a lot of it, didn't get, we've got more and more help and it just grew and it just grew. I mean, it really does tell me how important your work is with friends, with bread for the world. You really do, you, 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 you just, you know, the old Hubert Humphrey outside inside game, people, your allies like me work from the inside and try to help the outside and you keep pressure on us and, and keep, keep going the way you have so well. And we just, every time we introduced another bill or circulated a letter, we got more and more Democratic co-sponsors to the point right now on our letter, I'm looking at Chad, 41. we are at 41, yep, 41. For, on, the, on the letter to make this permanent, I mean, permanent child tax credit expansion, permanent EITC, we have 41 Democrats that have signed the letter. And the ones that didn't sign, you know, I'm going to vote for it, Sharon. I know you are. So, but anyway, so um, think about that. And you know what this means. It means $250 a, a month for a, a ch per child. If your child's over six, if your child's under six, what if they're six? Is it 250 it's or three? Zero to five. Zero to five. Okay. Yes. So six and over. Sorry, I don't know. I don't mean to discriminate against six-year-olds, but I just didn't know. But so well, six and above, they get 300, 250 a month. Under six, they get 300 a month. And what that means to a family, it means, you know, it, 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 it just, I mean, you know what it means. You've worked among people and for people for so long, so many of you. Um, so by this summer, we have, the IRS will have a system set up to distribute these checks monthly. Not So families, the, the, the bill... The bill uses the term periodic because we had to use that bill to get past the um, parliamentarian problem, um, So, which is fine. So the Secretary of the Treasury will make a determination. We are, some people want to make it mandatory monthly. Um, most of us think it should be the option of the beneficiary. So there may be some argument about that, but I, I think we trust people to know how to do this right to, to fit them. Now, the other thing I want to see no, I mean, you, 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 I mean you, you've seen what's happened in our society. It's CEOs pay is going up astronomically, uh, that, that, end of the, that, that corporations are more and more profitable. Workers are more and more um, uh, productive, yet wages have been flat. And particularly in the bottom half or two thirds wages if, if simply not kept up. And Dr. King used to say, no job is minimal. No job is um, menial. menial, I'm sorry. No job is menial 
Um, thank you, Katie, for giving me that. I was losing my mind. I'm about to get in the car and drive back to Cleveland, so I'm getting ahead of myself here. But no job is menial if it pays if it pays adequate wages. And uh, you have heard me talk a lot about the dignity of work in a term that Pope Leo the Thirteenth was the first time I read it. And Dr. King used to use talk about dignity so much. And there's there's just not, not much dignity in a job that doesn't pay enough to raise a family. And there is, I'll never forget, I, I thought back a year and a half, it been early 20, 2019, I, I thought about possibly running for president. And I, after two months, I just didn't have it in me to want to do what you got to do. But I remember speaking to the favorite, my wife and I went on kind of a two month dignity of work tour every weekend, we'd go somewhere. And my favorite moment was speaking to the um, hotel and restaurant employees union, local 226, D. Taylor is the president of that local. And my wife had written about, my wife's a newspaper columnist, she had written about this union. And it was, it was mostly women, overwhelmingly women, mostly women of color. And these workers, because they had a union, they're hotel and restaurant workers, they were minimally, they were minimal, minimum making $18 an hour. And um, you think about that, how, how different their lives were because of that. So um, I'll close with this, that uh, we still have so much to do to make this permanent. Uh, we need you to continue to weigh in, uh, if you would, of course. And uh, Reverend Jim Cho and Ms. Randall, we need you to, you and all of you watching to weigh in. Um, and I, I will close with, um, I am going to next month when we come back, lead on the Senate floor a reading. It's become a Senate tradition. Doug Jones did it. Doug Jones started it. And I used to participate. Now that he's left, I, I'm leading it. We, I find six senators, three in each party, and we read Dr. King's letter from a Birmingham jail. We break it into six parts. And, you know, he, you, you remember there was some, he was appealing to the white ministers of greater Birmingham who were moderates that Dr. Payne King, be patient. We just need, we're making progress in the civil rights movement. And he wrote them a letter saying, that we can't be patient any longer. But my favorite letter from the quote from that letter is when Dr. King said, progress never rolls in on the wheels of inevitability. Progress never rolls in on the wheels of inevitability. And, and friends and bread for the world show that, that you, you, you care about this, but you do things to advance justice. And um, few groups do it as unselfishly as you, as selflessly as you as smartly as you, as effectively as you. So um, thank you so much for the work you do. And uh, am I taking questions? I can yes. do that. Okay, questions. Yep. Thank you, Senator Brown. Uh, just thanks for your leadership, your tireless leadership uh, on behalf of the, the earned income tax credit and the child tax credit and people who are in need, people who have lived in poverty. And, and we are so struck by the generational change that, that the, the inclusion of those two tax credit bills in the American Rescue Plan has. So we know you've been uh, relentless in your pursuit of this. So thank you for that. As, as you have, so thank you. On the, on the call today with us are constituents, uh, our, our constituents, but people from all across the country, uh, people of faith who are active with Bread for the World and are active with the Friends Committee on National Legislation and people who approach their advocacy work from that heart center, which you've talked about, from that place of of uh, their, their Christian faith or their, uh, their own moral conviction. And so I'm interested in your, um, and, and I wanna also say that we are nonpartisan organizations, as you know, and really do work to try to have bipartisan support. I know there's a question already about how do we, what, what can we all do to encourage bipartisan support as we look to see these child tax credits extended uh, beyond what was in the American Rescue Plan? Well, it's, it's what you've done all along in so many ways and appeal to people, sense of decency, appeal to justice. Um, I mean, it breaks my heart to watch what's happening in Georgia now. I watched, um, I watched about a 10 minute interview today. I mean, I think it was a sort of impromptu news conference kind of interview with um, Reverend Warnock and, um, in Georgia. And I'm not sure where, it just was, it was outside somewhere and talking about voting rights. And um, I mean, it was, it was I, I've done a lot of reading and writing about Senate history and uh, we all know that it was Southern Democrats that were the worst uh, in the up end of the 1960s on civil rights and voting rights. And not that Republicans were always good, not that there weren't many Democrats that, you know, Northern Democrats were the 
most progressive in those issues. But, you know, there is no Olympia Snow or Cliff Case or Jake Javits or Ed Brook or uh, most Pearson's first name, the senator from Kansas, Pearson. There are, there are no moderate Republicans or moderate to liberal Republicans like that anymore. But reach them where they are. And um, I mean, to me, I, when I think about my Christian faith, my favorite, my, my favorite, um, probably my favorite quotation of the Bible is one that, that perhaps you haven't heard. Um, I'm not insulting you in any way, particularly you, Reverend Joe. Um, but um, Matthew 25, the Bible that I read growing up, the, the Revised Standard Version or King James, it, it says something like, Jesus said, when I was hungry, you fed me, when I was thirsty, you gave me drink, when I was in jail, in prison, you visited me. What you did for the least of these, you did for me. And I, I, I always remember in kind of in Sunday school and later, and I didn't think about it a lot, but when I did, I thought, you know, religious leaders would never say that Eugene Cho is worth less than Amelia Kagan, who's worth less than Chanya Johnson. Um, the, the, I mean, Maimonides wouldn't have said that. Uh, Jesus wouldn't have said that. Buddha wouldn't have said that. Muhammad wouldn't have said that. So a pastor friend, a UCC pastor friend of mine, um, she and her wife lived down the street from my wife and me. And she gave us a poverty and justice Bible, a different translation. And Matthew 25 goes like this. When I was hungry, you fed me. When I was thirsty, you gave me drink. When I was in prison, you visited me. What you did for those who seemed less important, not what you did for the least of these, what you seemed, to, what you did for. So I, I just think you, you appeal to self-professed Christians on Christian principles of justice and fair play and equal opportunity. Um, why wouldn't government do these kinds of things? I, you can also contrast with other countries, but that doesn't, contrast with other countries doesn't work with 21st century Republicans, or at least 21st century Trump Republicans, um, if there's a distinction. But um, I think appeal to them the way you know how, um, through their congregations. I mean, you certainly have members and activists in their states, and appeal to them through the churches the way you've done so well in the past. That, you know, we didn't get their help on this vote this time, but we still can. And some Republicans have been helpful over the years with, with not enough, but with the ITC and child tax credit. So we've got to figure out how to reach them better. Thank you, Senator, so much. Well, for can that. I say one other thing? I, I just saw yes, Elaine Lang wrote that Senator Romney suggested Child Alliance operated through SSI. Um, her question is, do you think it would be politically feasible to move the refundable CDC to SSA or should we focus on making the tax credit operated through? I, I think we keep with the IRS, but I also think that that's an opportunity to go to Romney. And um, my appeal to Governor Romney or to Senator Romney is, is um, his father was secretary of HUD. Um, you, you may remember that Congress passed voting rights, civil rights in 64, voting rights in 65 after the Johnson landslide. Couldn't get housing, open housing, outlaw discrimination in housing until Dr. King's assassination, literally the next week, I believe, passed open housing. Um, Governor Romney, Senator, I mean, the, 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 Mitt, Mitt Romney's father, George Romney, Governor Mich former Governor of Michigan, was Nixon's first choice for HUD. Nixon then pretty quickly devolved into his Southern strategy, seeing great opportunity for conservatives to, to displace Democrats in the South, which was this whole Southern strategy that essentially eliminated the Democratic Party in the South, Democratic Party that's my party in the South until now with more diversity. But, but Romney, I'm trying to, Romney has a, a good side, a very good side to him. His religious faith is important to him. His Justice is important to him. He sees the world very differently from the way I do, but he is, he's not a moderate by any means, but he's a decent man and, and could be receptive to your appeals. I, re I interrupted you, Reverend Cho. Go ahead. No, no, not at all. That was very helpful. Thank you. Uh, and thank you for sharing the story about uh, your mother, uh, Emily Campbell Brown. She's someone that uh, we discuss with lots of fondness at the bread offices. She's an example of thousands upon thousands of just everyday people who are compelled by faith to do something. And I think you spoke about something that's really important. There is a, a rampant growing cynicism that we're fighting with in our country. And yet we have to hear these stories of everyday people that are not succumbing to such cynicism. And so, so thank you again for uh, doing your part to encourage everyday people to partner and to speak up. 
Uh, you've also done some incredible advocacy, speaking up about the role of food banks and pantries. And uh, I'd love to maybe ask you a question about that. Food banks and pantries, as you know, run by churches, other faith groups, they have been trying to meet rising hunger during this pandemic. We're seeing percentages increase by hundreds of percent in terms of demand. Uh, with their resources stretched, what further role can, can they play? Um, how can we work together? Well, they're, they, you know, one of the things in Ohio, and I think it was national, they, they brought in, you know, they, they lost so many volunteers because of the virus, especially their older volunteers were, you know, were counseled by maybe the food bank, maybe a doctor, maybe just good sense to, um, to quit volunteering. And so they brought in some of them. And so they brought in the National Guard. You know, we had a major National Guard um, help with, I think, damn near every food bank in Ohio. Um, I just think that it's part of you know, it's part of your lobbying of the of the Ag Committee. Uh, the Ag Committee stepped up pretty well on, on all these issues. Uh, we need to do better with um, sort of across the board with with WIC. Um, I mean, to, one of the stunning things I learned soon after coming to the Senate, I don't think I knew this in the House. Um, I wasn't on the Ag Committee like I was in the Senate. Maybe I, maybe I wasn't listening. I don't know. But how... Um, how many, the, the, the number of this will give you a, and I see there's an Ohio in this called Dan Tucson. And I wanna to try to get to his question in a second. That, um, that uh, in, 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 in Ohio during the school year, 600,000 kids get food every day. I think 650, something like that are eligible. There's some drop off always, but um, so during a school day, though 600,000 kids get fed. Um, in the summer months, only 100,000 of those kids are in in a summer feeding program. So what, what happens to those kids on weekends, on holidays, on, and in the summer? And we still haven't addressed that very well. And that may be something that part of it's an organization, a big part of it's an organizational problem. It's not for one of desire, probably from both parties in the House and Senate. But um, I don't think the effort, and I'm hopeful the new Secretary of Agriculture, uh, the new old Secretary of Agriculture, the old new Secretary of Agriculture will, will take that up more than we have in the past. Um, that would obviate much of the, some of the demand at food banks. Um, but I think the, the hardest days for food banks are, are partly behind us, but I think we're gonna continue to see demand um, until you know, late summer when, when the economy really starts, starts to come back. Thank you for that. We, we, we do have some, some people from Ohio on the call, and I want to be respectful because since you're an Ohio senator, you clearly understand the, the purview of the whole country and what the needs are. Um, uh, our friend Michael Snarr uh, from Wilmington College asks about hope for uh, agricultural policy that is favorable for small, more sustainable farms. Do you see that in the offing? And then if I can just piggyback a question, because I know I think we only have you for a few more minutes. Um, one of the questions that I just want to, I want to go back to the tax credit programs. You noted that 92% of children in Ohio will benefit from the child tax credit. And I think um, if I understand the numbers, it's pretty similar across the country that the, the benefit is huge. Is, is this moving us more to, toward a guaranteed um, income for households? Um, that's a really good question. Um, I don't know. I, 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 it's, 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 I mean, we, we, we want to do this in a way that, that, you know, and I, I think of much through the prism of, of dignity of work, uh, what we need to do in terms of making, you know, making hard work pay off and hard, hard work is not just, um, you know, showing up and working every day. It's also, it's also raising children and taking care of aging parents. And that's why I think you, I think you're thinking that as you ask this question, Diane, that's, that's why this is so important that we do have a guaranteed income. I think this is the first and most significant building block to do this is permanence of the ITC and CPC because it will show it will show the country who we are. I, and and I, I, the, 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 the additive effect of that, if we, if we are able to get this, I mean, I, I think this whole um, recovery act coupled with the next two or three things we do, big and small, will show America that the era from the 1980s, sort of the Reagan revolution till now, 
that government, you know, that I'm from the government here to help you are the most dangerous words, whatever Reagan said. Um, that, 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 the, that the, the belief that the government couldn't work, and then so often people like Trump came into office and showed it couldn't work or wouldn't work. But the fact that Biden is the kind of president who really believes in government and that government can work and that we can expect um, such, we can expect so, so you know, government to do things that are really going to matter to people, and that's um, that's to me, from almost a political science and a practitioner viewpoint, to me is as exciting as anything we're doing um, to show that we are now showing. You know, voters are going to see. I mean, I, I, I've said to um, every cabinet official I interview, in order to be confirmed, you know, they 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 have, I'm sure they love doing this. They have to come around and you know talk to all of us. And every one of them I say, I want you to think in the back of your mind about a voter in Macon, Georgia in July of 2022. And that voter is gonna say, you know, I voted for Biden and Harris and I voted for Ossoff and Warnock and my life got better. And I wanna remind people that look what government did and your life got better. If we do that, we will then be in a position to do a guaranteed MCO and we will be able, we will show that government can work that the deficit is not a big problem, particularly with interest rates. So, I mean, I've heard the Republican appointed, Trump appointed chair of the Federal Reserve this week again, Jay Powell essentially say that, that this larger deficit, he didn't say it doesn't matter, but he said, I don't think he even said manageable, whatever term he said, he was he was dismissive of its of its oppressiveness on our stop stopping us from doing something. And say it very well, but you got the drift there. Uh, Michael Snar, um, Good. I, I, I recommend Michael Snar's book to all of you. Um, he and someone else, and I'm someone I'm forgetting her name. Michael's at Wilmington College. I don't know all my, I don't read books that all my constituents wrote. It just happens Michael's on this call. Um, but I didn't know he's going to be on this call. Michael and a woman from Hiram College, and I'm, I'm embarrassed. I hope, she, I hope she's not on the call because I'm leaving her out because I've known Mike. I know Michael better. I just could talk to her on the phone. But anyway, I wrote a really good book about religion and service and and selflessness that people ought to read. And I already forgot your question, Michael, but I did advertise your book. So forgive me for that. Sorry. Senator Brown, I know uh, we want to be respectful of your time. Would you have time for one more question? Sure. sure. Great. Well, I think this is an important question that came to the chat box. And it's one that I have also on my mind. And I'm just going to read it word for word. It's from our friend John Carr. Senator, thank you for your principled, persistent, faithful leadership for the least of these. And here's the question. How can we take on the false claims that tax credits will undermine work and family structure? Well, um, well, first of all, we don't, we don't say it does that when you give payouts to the rich. Uh, I, I'm not sure, and I, I hesitate to say this to a, a group with its faith base, like the two of you are in many ways, but um, I just think it's, it's, I was going to say class warfare. I don't really want to use that term, but I just did. Um, but I, I think it's, it's really all the way whose side are you on? And they, they, you know, I, I remember, I'm not going to mention the name in this story, but I was part of the negotiations in the first rescue, the, the CARES Act back in March when everybody ended up voting for it in the Senate. I mean, even Rand Paul and Ted Cruz, I mean, it was across the board. And the, um, I was negotiating this and we already had the $600 a week in the package for unemployment benefits. And I was arguing for rental assistance for people that are way that are behind on their rent through no fault of their own. And the Senator turned to me and he said, why do you, why do you want to give them rental assistance? These people are already are getting $600 a month. What more do, a week? What more do they need? And it was just this view that, that uh, low income people, especially if they're not my race, Low income people are lazy or, I mean, I just hear that too much. And I, I just think you push back from a, a moral standpoint and you ultimately show who's government on your side. And I, I didn't answer that question very well, but I, I just think fundamentally you push back in that way because there, there is just no evidence. People, most people want to work. And I, 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 I just always detect the hypocrisy. You know, they, 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 they talk about family values but then they don't want people to stay home with their kids. They want them out in the workplace making $9 an hour instead of home with their kids. Maybe we ought to do some things in the tax system and in the, our welfare system that allows people, particularly that first year, 
with child care when it's so important to be with your child. And so um, I just detect a little bit of hypocrisy in the other argument. Um, Dan Toussaint on this call, then I got to wrap up. Um, we're going to find more viable Democratic candidates. We're working with some groups in Ohio. I was on a call earlier today. Um, we've got to build a better farm system. I, Democrats are going to do better in Ohio. And, and next year's governor and Senate race, I won't make this very political. I'm, I'm hopeful there. So um, anyway, thank you all. Thank you, Senator Brown. Uh, thank you to Chad and Katie, your staff who've worked so closely with us. I wanna just tell our listeners and viewers that there is another half hour. Senator Brown has to go. Uh, he's got a lot on his plate, but uh, we have a panel of experts who are gonna be able to get to some of your questions, your specific questions. And just Senator Brown, I know you have a big job in front of you as the chair of the Banking, Housing and Urban Affairs Committee. And you mentioned the need for housing and rental assistance. Thank you for your leadership in that area as well. Um, and especially for these, the earned income tax credits and the child tax credits in the American Rescue Plan. We will, we pledge to continue working with you uh, in the coming months to see this enacted on a permanent basis. Thank you. And Reverend Cho, you need a sign behind you that says something like, love thy neighbor. Knows <laughs> see, I, I have FDR behind me and you have like books. Not that I'm against books, but really. So uh, I, have, I, have my, I do have my Bibles behind me. Okay, but I can't even see that, so. <laughs> All right. Thank you all. Good to see you all. Thanks. Thank everybody. you, Senator Thank you. Brown. Thank you so much. Eugene, you want to transit, transition us into the panel? Sure, sure. Well, again, we want to just thank everyone for joining us. As Diane mentioned, we have another half more hour of just really important dialogue, conversations, and really trying to equip ourselves for the important work of advocacy. This is just getting started. And so let me just take a moment to introduce our uh, experts, if you will, both from FCNL as well as from Bread. I might be a little um, um, biased here, but these are three of some of our best uh, experts uh, from our respective organizations. We have Amelia Keegan, who is FCNL's Legislative Director of Domestic Policy, Heather Valentine, Bread Director of Government Relations, and Chanya Johnson, Bread Senior Domestic Policy Analyst. Uh, I do want to make a little note that Chanya and I joined Bread at the exact same time about a year ago, and I have not seen her since. So every time I get to see her on a screen, I get really excited. So, um, well, friends, I would love to ask each of you just to share some of your, maybe your initial reactions to what Senator Brown shared and then we'll get to some questions. And speaking of questions, for those who are still with us, please continue to write down your questions that we might be able to ask our experts and panelists. Amelia, why don't you go first? Sure, thank you, Reverend Sho. And, and wow, what a, it's just such a, a delight to, to be with you all here today. This is, I couldn't imagine a better group of, of folks to be spending a Friday afternoon with. So really, thank you all for tuning in and for all of your enormous work um, on these two credits. I know beyond just uh, this year, but uh, through for, for many years. You know, it was great. I would say it was, it's always great to hear from such a champion like uh, Senator Brown, who has really been leading the, the charge on these um, credits for, for many years. You know, I, and I particularly appreciate hearing about the importance of the faith voice, right? And how coming from that faith perspective, that moral kind of perspective can really help in talking about the need for these credits uh, really from a, a bipartisan, uh, bipartisan basis, right? In talking to not just Democrats, but also Republicans about the importance of these credits and what they can, what that really means for um, individuals and families. So I think that was just a really good takeaway and to, to hear about kind of the work that, that still needs to be done to make sure that these credits are, in, are made permanent. And so that was, that was some of the kind of top line takeaways that I, I took from that conversation. Great, thank you, Chanya. Yeah, for me, um, again, thank you all so much. It was a very good conversation and I um, look forward to going through the chat and hopefully answering some more of the questions. But I think for me, um, this was my first time really hearing his story live about 
his engagement, his mother, and some of the things that she was doing. But for me, it underscored the importance and effectiveness of advocates on the ground, everyday people um, activating their voices, being involved in a process. And with his mom setting the example, I think many of our advocates and um, activists out in the field certainly understand the importance of continuing to stay the course. Even though we don't always get what we want directly from Congress, we have to stay the course. And so for me, it just renewed my faith and spirit to say continue advocating for all the things that we want for people who um, are less fortunate. Um, because we, like he said too, is that, listen, the big corporations are getting their piece of the pie. They're getting it. Nobody is like, no, 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 necessarily. Um, they have the big lobbyists who are advocating for them or lobbying for them. It's important that we lobby and advocate for everyday people. So I was super excited to hear that. And we'll continue to make sure we're educating our members to do the work as well. Great. Heather, can you um, chime in here? Sure. Um, it's great to, to see and hear everyone's voices. And obviously, Senator Brown, a continued champion. I've worked with him. I, I used to be at the National Education Association. And Mr. Brown's a big union guy. So I've known him for a long time. Um, one of the things that I am really most encouraged about is I think the faith voice now more than ever is so important on Capitol Hill. Um, it's important in our bipartisan work. I think, you know, I, I often talk to people in the bright community, and I'm sure Amelia um, and Diane um, hear the same. Well, my member of Congress is never going to support this. So, so why should I keep raising it? But I think um, what we're seeing is um, the importance of the faith voice, I think, in a bipartisan um, way. You know, we've seen Mr. Romney, we don't agree with the pay fors um, on some of um, his priorities um, and, and how he's going to pay for CTC, but we are seeing bipartisan support. And like um, Mr. Brown said, um, we are seeing that across the aisle and across chambers. So I'm really excited. I just think it's, it's a really cool time um, to have our voice on Capitol Hill. So can I just jump in and ask um, you, uh, the three of you, maybe one or, or all of you want to respond, what's the state of play right now in Congress? Now that the American Rescue Plan has been signed by the president, people have gotten checks in the mailbox. When, when, will, the, when will the child tax credit earned income tax credit kick in? And what are the limitations that were of it uh, through the American Rescue Plan? What's the next thing we need to do? Sure, I can, I can start. And then I know Heather and, and Shania can also add to it. So yeah, the American Rescue Plan signed into law um, as we all know, you know, these are tax credits. Normally we collect our tax kind of refunds and those tax credits at tax time. So um, for the earned income tax credit improvements, those will be available kind of in, in 2022. Uh, but the, the child tax credit, one of the huge important pieces that Senator Brown was talking about is that trying to make these periodic payments potentially monthly. And so the idea was that starting in July, those child tax credit advance payments would come out, um, hopefully monthly. Uh, so that is kind of when the, the timing, we'll see what the IRS is able to do. But as, as the Senator mentioned, these expansions only last one year, right? So unless Congress acts, uh, these huge improvements that we've been working so hard to accomplish will expire. And so we really need to press Congress to make these expansions permanent. And the next kind of build back better or infrastructure bill, recovery bill that we're expecting to come from the White House, uh, President Biden is going to be issuing a much anticipated speech next week where he's going to start laying out the, the framework of some of this. We want, that is our opportunity to make these improvements permanent. And so that's really kind of the, the action and what we all need to take away from this is that the next step in advocacy is to make sure that those improvements are included in this next package. And if I can just echo um, what um or build on what Amelia said, I think um, we have to be, you know, in the bread community, and I'm sure, you know, this is across the board, we often think, oh, well, is this going to be another reconciliation package? Is this going to be a partisan package? Are we going to see the same vote we saw in the American Rescue Plan? And, and, and we might for child tax credit, but, and EITC, but what's so important 
is that right now everyone is fighting for a little piece of the pie, right? There are so many issues that people um, care about and issues that we care about. So it's really important that we keep this up because it's not a guarantee. We have to be really, really um, conscientious about our outreach and, 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 keep, it, and keep it going because um, we don't wanna take this for granted. We have so much support. So now is the time to keep moving for you know, making this permanent or at least getting this extension. But you know, again, we think we have the bipartisan support to do it. And so we're really excited, but we have to keep that momentum up. Chanya, and do you want to chime in? I okay. know both of my colleagues have addressed the issue. I think I would say, because we're, we're talking about what we need to do is, I think it's important that we reach out, we encourage our members to continue to reach out to Congress now about these credits. That's one of the things we, we know it's a Friday and we know they're going home, but it's important that throughout the conversation and during this period that we reach out to our members of Congress. So I just want to let folks know that they can take action by going to bread.org backslash tax credits for bread and for, FN, for fcnl.org backslash tax credits. And so both of those will be placed in the chat and we just would appreciate your continuous support and the efforts that you can make to make sure that your voice is heard. So reach out to your member of Congress if you have some additional questions. Certainly we'll be available at FCNL and Bread to address those. But in the interim, we wanna make sure you guys take action because it's gonna be very important that um, they hear from you about the importance and the impact and how families are gonna be able to benefit from those tax credits, um, whether it be EITC or CTC. Thank you so much. You know, it's really important for us to acknowledge that you know, we've been working on these things for years before it yeah. became part of the larger consciousness and conversation. And I think it's a reminder to every single one of us that you have to toil on a daily grind. You've got to keep working at it. Sometimes in our culture, we're kind of enamored by the spectacular things, but it's showing up every single day. It's speaking up. And so even after this call, when Chanya is inviting all of you to take action, don't just think about it, do it and do it on a regular basis. We've got some questions that are coming in and I'll just ask a question. Diane will probably chime in with some questions that she's seeing as well. Uh, this is a, a year of reckoning for lots of reasons. And we have been uh, sadly uh, and tragically reminded about the disparity on the suffering on communities of color in our nation. And so I'd love to ask uh, any of you to chime in about what will the impact be of EITC and CTC expansions be on communities of color? Sure, I can, I can start and then I know others can join. Uh, Certainly we know that the uh, there's a huge disproportionate impact in kind of who these credits will reach, especially the, the expansions. The, the child tax credit improvements will, is, you know, according to the study by Columbia University, could cut child poverty nearly in half. Um, you, we've had about 27 million kids whose parents couldn't claim the full value of the credit because they didn't make enough money, right? And that was very much disproportionately when you look at who those families are, those are families of color. So in terms of, uh, uh, you've got about, just in terms of kids who will benefit um, from the, the, the expansions of the child tax credit, it's 5.7 million uh, black uh, children and 9.9, .9, nearly 10 million uh, Latinx uh, children. So that's a, like, when you're looking at the numbers, it is much dis disproportionately going to uh, go to communities of color and families of color. Yeah, and, and um, to build on what Amelia said, um, the Center uh, for Budget um, Policy and Priorities has great state-by-state -state data, um, not only broken down by race, but also by military, by just different um, economic groups. And it's really good information. So I just looked up Arkansas, because that's the one that hit. And um, um, I use those all the time, but they're really great to talk about the benefits that are gonna happen um, on a state-by-state -state basis. Um, and I think they've even done some 
um, based on congressional districts. I'm not sure how public that is, but if you contact me, I mean, I think we can look at, you know, um, what Hamilton, Ohio is doing versus what Miami, Florida is doing. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of great data there on um, how this will benefit each state and each population. And I would just add too, and I see there's some things going on in the chat, so I'm a little distracted, but um, Heather will post some of that information there. The, uh, the additional thing too is, and I know that we did the data, particularly on African-American, Latinx, uh, Hispanics, but also, you know, people want to know, so what about white people? And so I would say to that, it's going to reduce hunger across the board. It's going to lift families out of poverty. So it's not um, one group against the other. But when this passes and when this is um, extended and we're, we're really fighting hard for permanence, it's not just about one, it's about all of those communities who are struggling, who need the assistance. We know that with SNAP, families run out of benefits, what, about the 15th day of the month. So that additional monthly benefit, if approved, could assist families in getting more food. I get that some people want to think that they know what people will do with the money, buy things that they're not supposed to buy. My thing is we know the intent of it is to give the families the resources to be able to uh, thrive throughout the whole month and to take care of their families. Um, and so what that looks like is just making sure people have the resources and the ability to make the decision to get the things that they need. But um, for that particular population, certainly we can provide those numbers for you, but we know at the end of the day, it's going to um, end reduce poverty um, and we'll be on our way to end in hunger. We have a lot of questions coming in about where to find specific information about eligibility for these programs, as well as the data on how uh, it will be distributed. And uh, Heather referred to the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities, which is one of our great partners that does a lot of think tank work and analysis and research. And we can put the link to the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities in, and you can investigate this by state by state. Um, and there are other sources, I think, even on probably on our websites that you can go to. And so we can try to get some of those links up for you to do further research. And I don't want to, I don't want to, I, I certainly want to invite uh, Chanya and Heather and Amelia to share some of those details if they have them. I, I just want to offer a comment here. And I, and it's, it's to the, it's, it's to what Senator Brown said and what um, Eugene Cho said and what others have said about the inherent dignity of every single person. I mean, that is, that is really the basis for a lot of our faith is that we do believe there is that of God in every person. And we also, many of us believe in, in the dignity of work and we believe in the dignity of families. And we believe and trust that parents will make choices for their families. Um, there is often an assumption that people who are poor don't make good choices. And um, the fact is that there are people who are rich who don't make good choices. That the, the, the income level that we have does not necessarily determine um, whether we're great parents or not great parents, or whether we spend our money wisely or don't spend our money wisely. And so I'm, I'm just speaking out against assumptions that we sometimes uh, make about people whose incomes are lower. And it's important for us to remember the inherent dignity of every person and every family uh, drives a lot of these policy decisions that, that we are making. So I, giving my own, uh, I guess, editorial opinion here, but it is a theme that we've been talking about and just appreciation to elected officials who also see that. Um, I wanna invite you to, to uh, respond, um, Heather or Amelia Chanya, about, about any of the details about where to find out more information if people are looking for information about the tax credit programs, um, the benefits of those or, or some of the other things. You're, you're tracking some of these questions that are coming up in the chat as well. I just added to the chat the information. We, do, we rely heavily on the research that we're getting from the, um, the Center on Budget and Public uh, Policy Priorities. And so I placed some links there, about three links, and that gives you sort of the um, a quick kind of run through of what it's about, who benefits and how you can find the information. But if you do have specific questions, because we're not going to be able to get to them all right now, certainly you can feel free to reach out to us at Bread. I will drop my email address in the chat. And if you just really got to talk to me, I'll drop my phone number as well. Um, but we want to make sure that we're being a resource to you so you have the information so that you can be informed and make choices to share the information with other constituencies. So thank you so much. 
And I, I just wanted to highlight, um, Diane, thank you for saying that. Um, you know, I come from the Republican side of Capitol Hill and Speaker Boehner, and I can tell you, um, dignity and choice are huge words uh, for Republicans on Capitol Hill. People should be able to make their own choice on um, the food they provide, um, how they raise their families. So I think often we, um, you know, um, Democrats come out strong and, and obviously doing a ton of work that we support, but this is, this is bipartisan. And I want everyone to know that, that we can have these conversations, but the dignity, um, the choice, those are, those are huge Republican catchphrases. Um, and I think, you know, if you look at what Mr. Romney said on the floor, or if you look at what Mr. Neal said or, or um, on the house floor, you're, you're going to see a strong, um, that word choice and um, allowing families to, to make those choices. It's gonna be a huge Republican talking point as we move through this process. Yeah, and I, I would just add um, in, in terms of responding to, to some of the answers in that about kind of not just where, what do um, families and individuals spend their tax credit dollars on, but kind of the, the impacts and effectiveness of these programs. We actually do have a lot of data that shows the effectiveness of these programs. And, um, and because they've been around for a bit of time, we have some long-term data that actually shows that family, that children who are in families that re receive the earned income tax credit and the child tax credit actually end up doing better in school. They're more likely to graduate from high school. They're more likely to attend college. They're more likely to have higher earnings as adults. So we can really point to what good investments these are for our society as a whole. Additionally, there's data that shows kind of what do families and individuals spend their tax credit dollars on, and it and it's things that you would assume, right? It's basic household ex expenses, or oftentimes because up to this point, the child tax credit and the, and the earned income tax credit come as a lump sum at tax time. They can use to build assets or help pay down debts or maybe help buy a new car or something like that. So usually they're they're used to pay for um, general basic expenses. And, and we do have research and data that point and the, just how effective these uh, these programs are. There was some, uh, I'll point to one additional uh, stat that uh, there was a study done earlier kind of this decade that showed that the expansions in the earned income tax credit actually did more to increase earnings and bring uh, more particularly mothers into the workforce than anything else at that time, more than the good economy of the 1990s and more than welfare reform. So it shows just how powerful these programs are at really supporting families and boosting earnings. And, um, you know, just to tack on what Amelia said, um, Sometimes I feel like we're always going into offices, at least I feel this way, that's my job, but I'm always going in and asking for more money. We need more in this system. But one of the key talking points is really this distribution on a monthly basis. It's key to helping those in poverty. It's key to, um, I think, you know, not having this lump sum, as uh, Amelia said, around um, tax time. So there are other ways um, to go into maybe a, a, an office that you don't think is going to be super supportive, but to talk about like why these provisions are so important. It's not always just about we need more money, but the way that it's distributed and making sure that it's helping those who need it the most. This has been really helpful for me as well, because I think what we need is a juxtaposition of real stories of real people that are struggling, that bear the inherent image of God. But we're not just sharing stories, we're also saying that there is robust data uh, to give credence to the things that we're speaking of. This really, really matters. The question that I asked Senator Brown earlier about, uh, about misinformation. Uh, I think there is a battle for narrative that is going on right now. And part of justice work is to tell the truth. To, to be truth tellers. This is why it's really important for each and every single one of us to be doing the, the robust work. You know, as Diane mentioned earlier, um, you know, one thing that I would love to just add to this conversation is during the 2007 financial crisis, uh, we saw uh, the banking industry commit crimes. Uh, that was proven, but we don't go around accusing every single banker of being criminals. 
if we're honest, we can acknowledge that there are individuals in every single social economics uh, class that don't abide by the rules, but it is a very small percentage. We can't allow that reality to be the majority, and that's why misinformation spreads. So I, I wanna be respectful of everyone's time. I would love for every single one of us, and, and maybe Diane, you as well, what's one thing that you would urge those who might be watching us to take? What's one step that you would urge everyone that's watching to take? And uh, we'll go with Diane, Chanya, Amelia, and then we'll end with Heather. Uh, Diane, why don't you begin? Well, thank you so much, Eugene, and thank you for co-hosting this with FCNL. Really, it's a, it's a great partnership we have with Brad, and just want to also give a nod to the fact that there are scores of other faith-based partners who work with us and, and scores of coalition partners that uh, are really uh, side by side in all this work, and so we, we give a shout out to them and gratitude as well. Um, I, I, I do think, I, I got, I'm going to take two things. One is stay informed. And we've given you some resources here today to stay informed. I think we both have, uh, both organizations have fabulous websites. Take some time, explore those websites, learn more. There's always an action item you can take to build a relationship with your member of Congress. And uh, that's really what we encourage is that don't just think of this as a one-off, oh, I'm going to make this is, as, as Eugene said earlier, this, this is work day after day, week after week, month after month, and stay with us on that. And then I'll just also say your prayers matter. Your good intentions matter. The fact that you are willing to uh, be informed and talk to others about what you learn and hold us, you know, hold us in, in prayer and hold um, one another in your community in prayer, that, that makes a difference. I will add, I will build on what um, Diane has said because she said exactly what I wanted to say uh, is that it's not a one off. You know, it's I, I when I talk to people about advocacy, I always say and many of us know it's not a one night stand. You cannot you cannot think that you're going to impact Congress by just being a one and done. It's a continuous process, a cycle of asking the question, why, how, who? How, who should I help? Where should I go? So you have to um, continue to ask the question. When you know things are not working in your favor for yourself or for your community, you have to continue to push the envelope. Then the second thing is that we provided resources to each of you that you can still be involved in the process. We both are gonna serve as resources for you um, throughout the year. And we're gonna be talking about the issues. We're gonna be doing more webinars and things like that. And so stay connected to um, what we're doing um, and the last thing is to act. Um, we've given you both those, um, the URLs to make sure that you go and you write about the tax credit. And if that ain't the issue that really rocks with you, you can find another issue on either one of our websites that you can use to advocate for everyday people. So again, thank you all for having me and we look forward to working with you. Yeah, I think Johnny and, and Diane pretty much said it. I, you know, if you're gonna do one, one, thing, one thing you can do out of this, can write your members of Congress, but I would also say schedule a lobby visit, right? You can do that pretty easily, especially over Zoom, schedule a call, a virtual visit. Both of our websites have, have uh, resources for you to do that, but we know that is probably the most effective thing you can do of actually meeting with your member of Congress, sharing your story, and talking about why they need to make these improvements permanent. Yeah, and I mean, everyone really covered it, but don't be don't be afraid to be a little bit of an instigator. Have those conversations. Um, I am always I always say I'm I'm kind of a lone Republican in a lot of conversations on Capitol Hill, but don't be afraid to raise your voice. Um, I was laughing last night. I was outside. I was taking the trash out. My my next door neighbor's son, who's eight, said, "What's going on with child tax credit, HV?" So I talk about it all the time. I mean, that is my job. So, um, you know, use us as a resource and also bring us ideas. If you see things that are happening in your community that we can highlight or um, voices being raised about this, let us know. Um, you know, we're in DC. Um, sometimes we can't see what's going on across the country. But like I said, don't be afraid. It's not a, you know, it's not a Republican. It's not a Democrat issue. We just need to come together. And if we don't raise our voices um, for, for those who might not have um, the opportunity, then I don't know who else will. So we should be proud and excited. And it's just, it's a great time. So, yeah. 
Thank you to our panelists and our experts. Diane, thank you again so much for the privilege of uh, co-hosting this with you. Uh, some closing remarks for me, if I may. Uh, the good news here, friends, is that you're not alone. Uh, you're joined by hundreds of people on this call that care about justice and mercy and humility. We want you to know that Bread and FCNL, we don't work in isolation. We work in partnership with many other people because it really does require a choir, a choir of women and men and children of all backgrounds, of all faith, to stand up for that which is right. So as you walk away, please be encouraged to keep pressing on. It's a marathon and not a sprint. And so with that in mind, we wanna thank you again for joining us. God bless you. Thank you and goodbye.